board. Now we are about to have our uh, next speaker, uh, who you've already met today, but once again, I will introduce him. He is Kai Whiting. He is the researcher and lecturer in sustainability and stoicism based at the UC Levain, Belgium. He is the co-author of the book, Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living, and tweets it at Kai Whiting and blogs over at stoickai.com. And if he ever decides to say that he wants to pick you up at the airport, be expected that he'll take you via public transportation. This is Kai Whiting's talk on Stoicism for a World Worth Living. Hello, and thank you for being here with me today. My name is Kai Whiting and I'm based at the UC Louvain in Belgium. I'm really grateful that we could spend some time, some time together here at Stoke on X Midwest 2020. Some of you may know my work already, um, but for those of you that don't know it, um, I'm particularly associated with stoicism and sustainability. So before I launch into stoicism for a world worth living in, I just want you to think about the blank space that I've left on purpose here. I want to ask you to fill that space with the world that you think would be the world worth living in. Now it's you to do that because stoicism doesn't have any rules, so to speak. The only one is that virtue is good and the only good and the only thing that is sufficient and necessary for us to prosper as humans. What does the world, what does a world worth living in mean to you? Would it look the same? Would it look different? And what would be your role in it? <clears throat> so most people that have come across me came across me in Stoke on London 2018, when I started to ask, what is stoicism for a better world? What does it mean? Is this philosophy just a personal one or is there something more it can offer? And in my Stoic on speech, I showed an image. And the image was an addition to Heracles' circles of concern, with the concept really highlighting to us what our obligations and civic duties are to ourselves, our family, friends, and wider humanity. But I argued that there was a massive thing missing, that there was an elephant in the room. And I thought that was Earth. I didn't think that by myself, I had co-authors, but I was very determined to highlight the fact that sometimes we really do not see the wood for the trees. We do not see the obvious. And it was obvious to me at least that without the earth, humanity could not prosper. Without the natural processes that we take advantage of, we wouldn't have the clean water and the clean air. Without the resources that we extract, consume and dispose of in, in an unfortunate manner, we wouldn't have the social economic development that we depend on today for much of our, our ways of living. And I also look, reflected on the fact that sustainable development, as in making sure that present generations do not consume so much that future generations have nothing left, is inherently linked to the four strike virtues. Of course, if we're greedy, which is the opposite of self-control, we will consume too much. If we do not think it's reasonable uh, that future generations have a chance to live according to their own uh, nature and meet their own needs, I think that's a question of Justice. I think it's courage. It takes courage to, to say that sometimes when we have the me, myself, and I mantra, when we talk about I want it now. I think it's a question of wisdom too, about giving our children what they need. I think that's a wise thing to do, or why bring them in into the world in the first place. And I left people with Harari's quote: why not add humankind and planet Earth to that list of loyalty? of looking at one's neighborhood. And I think that's a very cosmopolitan idea. And I felt that taking into consideration the earth and behaving in a way that enhanced the way that nature operates and functions is living according to nature. And that certain practices such as how we um, farm do not allow wildlife to live according to their nature and therefore I didn't find it very coherent with the stoic message of live according to nature which is both our own nature and nature as the whole. 
My research extended from that point into other things. I was particularly interested in what it meant to be human. So along with uh, Greg Sadler, Professor Chris Gill and Leonidas Konstantikos, we asked that very question. Were Neanderthals reasonable? Did they create, did they possess reason? Were they rational? And what did that mean? I asked myself the question on various, on various occasions, what can Stoic theology do? Is it just some uh, interesting idea that has no value today? Or as I, I see it, can it not allow us to approach environmental challenges in a different way? Does logocentric mean reason uh, centered pantheism tell us something that we're missing? Are we missing the wider picture by assuming that the atheistic or agnostic interpretation of stoicism may be the only way or the most appropriate way? That's, I'll leave that for you to decide. But that's something that I often uh, work on, think about. I also worked with William Stevens on how a stoic might approach dietary matters if they were really sincere in their commitment to live according to nature. If anybody wants a copy of my research papers, you can find them on stoichai.com or you can fill in the contact form on stoichai.com and ask me for them and I'm happily send them to you. For me, the question has always been and will always be about the common good. I see stoicism something that is not just restricted to a quote unquote self-development. It's not just restricted to the individual. For me, it has collective value because to live according to nature isn't just about you. Virtue does not exist in a vacuum. It cannot exist in stoicism in a vacuum because it must be made manifest through our actions. And although we can act by ourselves, and we often do, we don't always or necessarily restrict our virtuous actions to the things that only link to us. How could we, if we are employers or employees, if we are teachers or we're students, if we go and talk to anybody, how do we talk to them? Why do we talk to them? That's not a restricted, isolated affair. So there is a collective situation that we do have to consider. I think Stoics are definitely called to engage in what some people might call a self-development approach. I do believe that we are called to look at our strengths and work out how they can be used in the most appropriate manner. But I do believe that an appropriate manner is not restricted to how can I have a bigger bicep? How can I have a flat stomach? How can I be the most educated individual that worked, walked upon the earth and have the PhD piece of paper behind me? How can I earn more money? How can I in, in, uh, enhance my social status? I just don't believe for one moment that stoicism is talking about those kind of things when we are asking about what is your individual nature? What is your role? What is your strengths? What are your talents and abilities? Stoicism really talked about applying those things so that we can help society so that we can play our role. Or playing a role is really a one man or one woman band theatre piece. It really is looking at, am I behaving in a way that is compatible with the common good? To use Marcus Aurelius' expression, what is good for the beehive is good for the bee. Zeno definitely, in my opinion, had the good of the whole in mind when he founded and developed Stoicism as a philosophy. This is obvious to me because he spent a lot of time writing his greatest masterpiece, which was The Republic. The Republic was not a self-help book about how to be a better individual for your own sake. It was about how to fulfill your civic duties how to be a better citizen because the Republic was the ideal Stoic city of sages, of the wise. Virtue was the only distinguishing feature. And despite the fact that a lot of people come across Stoicism through Silicon Valley Stoicism, a phrase that Leonidas Constantinopoulos and I coined to highlight the superficial um, understanding of Stoicism, when it's only restricted to enhancing business acumen. 
that stoicism is a lot is a stoicism that a lot of people come to and through and yet zeno says that the ideal city has no money that the wise would only need to trade they'd have no need for money so if, if he does not agree that there's a need for money i really don't think he would agree with a stoicism that is is focused on how to improve your strengths in business and how to make more money or how to promote yourself or get promoted it doesn't mean that those things are not um, significant on occasion for some people but it's certainly not a stoic virtue it's not what job you have but how you go about doing your job in line with the stoic virtues and in line with living according to nature Sino's republic has no temples has no sacred buildings reverence to god or to reason is very much an outdoor activity so i really see that living according to nature isn't just about me myself and i or humans as individuals it really is aligning oneself with the divine reason men and women wear the same clothes why because the, the clothes are not a defining factor in one's virtue they make no difference for the same reason Zeno neither condemns homosexuality or polyamory. Why? Because again, he did not believe that homosexuality or polyamory per se affected or influenced upon one virtue. Everyone in Zeno Republic lives according to nature. There's only natural law. There's no universal law that you must do something other than progress towards virtue. They, they can't be because he recognizes that everybody has a different role. Um, you might say, does that mean there's no traffic lights? Then there's no traffic uh, wardens. There's nothing, no parking tickets. Well, a sage, if he had a, you know, was parking somewhere, he'd have to have a very good reason. It wouldn't just be because he wanted to quickly nip or she wanted to quickly nip to the shop and get something and couldn't be bothered to walk the extra five minutes. It would be because there was literally an emergency and uh, it was reasonable that they'd park there. So there'd be no reason to have even parking tickets. Tino's ideas, I would argue, aren't typical to self-help. Self-help isn't typically focused on civic duties or the collective or what it means to be part of the whole. It certainly doesn't normally celebrate virtue as the main focus, as in being having money is a preferred preferred indifference. Like if I have it, then good. I'd rather have it than not have it, but not at the cost of virtue. So I started to wonder with Leonidas Constantikos, if it was possible to write a book based on Zeno's principles, or well, his principles and those that developed by his students, not a book about Zeno, but a book about how his principles worked and how you could apply them in the contemporary context. So to do that, we did take Zeno, but we also took Chrysippus, who's a, who was a long distance runner, and Cleanthes, who was a boxer, and Spherus, who is my favorite Stoic, and often overlooked, he was the Stoic responsible for taking uh, Stoicism to Sparta. The connection between Stoicism and Sparta is not resilience and toughness. It is political reform because Spherus helped King Cleomenes III bring social, economic, and land reform to Sparta. So when people tell me Stoicism is only for the individual, that when I start to use collective applications, I'd simply say you didn't look at the primaries that I looked at, perhaps. You didn't do your homework, perhaps. We also, um, so yeah, if you want to know more about Spheris and Sparta, we did spend a long time writing about it because it really is overlooked. A lot of times Spheris is only really um, talked about when he, when he says, I don't think that really was a pomegranate. Uh, those that who have uh, been in Stoicism a long time now, you'll, you'll probably know that story. But you may not know that Machiavelli speaks about King Cleomenes III and the Stoic reforms. So that was the point of, of being better. It was to express you know, the stories or elaborate upon the stories of Zeno, Spheras, Chrysippus, Cleanthes, even Posidonius, Penitius, Cato. We wanted to do it in a way that was accessible to people if they just picked up the book because they like the cover, which I actually like too. So it would be a reasonable um, thing to do. And people who had been to Stoicism for years, I actually did uh, a few questionnaires with people, or a few surveys with people to see what they knew and what they didn't know. 
what they'd focused on in their own research, even academic strikes, I was able to see, okay, what, who do they really focus on and who maybe not so much? Because I wanted people to know about maybe some of the quote unquote lesser strikes, not because they're not as virtuous, but because they didn't write as much or their writings were lost. So if you, so I wanted to, with Leo to do that, I wanted to show that stoicism, stoicism was something bigger than we had imagined when we talk about self-help. I also wanted to show there were contemporary examples where you could use those principles. And I will talk about uh, how we do that in terms of living according to nature. Now, before I do that though, I think it's very important to say, you know, or to reiterate that your role is yours. There's no universal rule because each rule would be slightly different according to what your role was. So in the book, although we give examples, we don't tell you what you should or shouldn't do because that really depends on who you are. It depends on where you are. It depends on what family you belong to, what friends you have, how much influence in your friendship circles you have, what job you want based on your preferences. The worst thing you can do actually is to occupy a role that isn't yours. Epictetus says, if you take on some role that is beyond your powers, you disgrace yourself. Why? Because you neglect the role that you were capable of fulfilling. So we, we didn't want everybody to suddenly run out and say, this is what stirs us, this is how I, I, I act living according to nature. I should be X, Y, and Z. No, that really isn't how stoicism works. That's the beauty and the difficulty, the challenge and the, I think the, the benefit of being, of being stoic or adhering to stoic principles is that you do have that flexibility and you are called to use your reason, which you possess through um, the divinity of, or the logos or the patterning of the universe, depending how you want to see it. So the most important thing I can offer you today is I'm not gonna tell you how to live according to nature in A, B or C. I would say that you should examine your life and spend time working out what you, who you are what you can reasonably be and do based on the various factors that make you who you are. Um, in terms of just to give you an example, we don't have empathy, why? Because I can't put my shoes myself in your shoes. If I did that, my feet would be scrunched, right? They might be too big or too small. And I don't, you don't need to know how my feet fit in your shoes, you need to know how your feet fit in your shoes. That's why, again, we don't really say as a Stoic, you should do this. And why I highlighted in Stoic on 2018 that I think it is Stoic to be sustainable because I believe that that is a modern manifestation of the virtues. But how you do that, that depends on your role. How do you undertake your role? So I've just told you that once you found, you know, that no one has exactly the same role as everybody, anybody else because of the different circumstances. But I can tell you that it is clear how we undertake it, regardless of what that role is. And Epictetus gives us this information. If someone ordered a singer in a chorus to know himself, would he not attend to the order, paying attention both to his fellow chorus members and to harmonizing with them? And I think that's absolutely right. I actually like to think of roles um, in terms of either being in an orchestra or being in a choir. So depending on what position you play in the orchestra, in what instrument you play, but also where you are, are you number one violinist or you number two? Would it take the exact time that you play or the exact solo that you do? It's not, it's not good enough in an orchestra to be the best violinist. Being in terms of you can play the violin slower or faster than uh, as need be, your fingers are stronger, you hold the, hold, hold the bow better. It's not about that. Being number one violinist also is about playing your violin to enhance the collective sound. You can imagine if the violin starts to play the most beautiful piece at the wrong time and they'd cease to be the, the number one or the top violinist. It is about making those around you sound good too. It's about harmonizing the same in your voice. You, you cannot drown out other people's voices and you must be careful with your tone and with the heaviness of the note. And this just shows you that we are all called to work towards the common good rather than causing friction as individuals, and you can apply that on the wider scale. I think that it's about what am I doing for nature? Am I working with nature or am I against it? Traditionally, Stoicism has talked about the animal, the universe, a living, breathing thing, and we're just part of a limb. So we can choose to go with the animal or we can choose to go against it. 
when we choose to go against the animal, we suffer and the animal itself would suffer because it doesn't function in the way that it should and nor do we. The important thing here as well is to be consistent. If you do one thing right one time, that doesn't mean that you're creating character. It doesn't mean that you're acting in accordance with your role. That's why I think we have the phrase, he's acting out or she's acting out of character. Character is built in succession. You do acts over and over and over again. And then people say you're generous. It's not because you're generous one time that you suddenly become known as a generous person, for example. And we have many roles for our life. Just because you have one role now doesn't mean that you're going to have the role for your rest of, rest of your life. For example, if your parents die, you cease to be their son, right? If you, move jo if you change jobs, you cease to be a police officer, you may now be working in IT. And what you do in that role cannot be the same because it, it wouldn't make any sense. In terms of contradictory, a very clear example would be a judge. If, if they're not just, they're actually contradicting what is expected of them, what could be reasonably expected of them. And so when we try to play a role that isn't ours, Epitaius says we contradict our capacity for reason. And he talked about brutalized humanity being one where our sense of shame and mostly have been chopped off because we're not doing the things right for the right reason. So once you know your role, once you've thought about it, how would you live it? Personally, I'd like to give Posidonius' example, which is one example, but we do give in the book, which is link, which we give in terms of living according to nature. And I like this example because being an academic, it really does relate to me. So I'm nowhere near as scientific or as academic as he was. I really think that he was the greatest academic that we've had in the history of Stoicism. He was certainly revered by Seneca, Gallen, Strabo for his breadth and depth of knowledge. He knew from anthropology, literally to zoology. And he really believed that science, or what we, what we would now call science, was the way to understand the mind of God. And you might even say, move, you know, move over Stephen Hawking. He was the first scientist who really wanted a grand fear of everything. He thought the more he knew, the more he would, he would understand God, the more he would be intricately connected to the mind of God, and he would be, um, as a result, living in a more virtuous manner. Uh, if anybody wants to know where this picture is, it's actually the Archaeological Museum in Naples. So, you, you know, this man is uh, recognised and revered, even though he's not necessarily seen as a significant stoic when people talk about, say, Marcus Aurelius, but he is, he was recognised and he was revered for his knowledge. His belief in God um, drove him high and wide. And we have to remember that in the ancient period, it wasn't just a getting on a plane and sitting there for a couple of hours, however uncomfortable that might be, to get from one place to the other. It could be a very dangerous affair. I, I often say that exiled people think that the problem is being exiled. Uh, back in the ancient period that you're in a, period, in a place you don't want to be, I would say the danger is the process of going to where you are being exiled, because you'd go from no man's, you know, from city to a no man's land. It would be a dangerous place. You might run out of uh, food. You might get sick. You might not have. You might lose your way, and you're very likely to be robbed or subject to a violent crime. So he really moved a lot for somebody back in that period because it was knowledge that drove him. He was not content to sit in his uh, his office or his in the equivalent of an office or a lab. He had to go out and see things. He, he went to see druids to understand the tides and celestial bodies. He could have just took, you know, somebody else's account, Julius Caesar wrote own account, but he wanted to know himself what the druids were like. Posidonius, interestingly enough, wasn't only about knowledge. I mean, he was really like the, the brainy stoic of the day, but he had a fundamentally important uh, consideration, and that was to, in his role as a scientist, was to teach and not just to teach facts, but to teach values. And Cicero was one of his students and he calls him the greatest of all Stoics. And I really don't believe that Cicero would just call him that because he was knowledgeable. We all know someone who's knowledgeable, who doesn't want to share their knowledge and actually we can build resentment sometimes. It was because he was knowledgeable and he wanted to share it. He wanted other people to draw closer to God too. He wanted them to do that so they could fulfill their obligations, civic duties, not just because they could be a better person in the, in the, for their own sake. 
Because why? Going back to our duties as Stoics is to be pro-social. We need to keep the ball up in the air. In the air. We can't be like these two individuals fighting over the ball, trying to keep it for ourselves. We are called to always work in a team and with each other. So give you an example. Pisidonius told Pompey, uh, the Roman statesman, another one of his students, try to reason with the pirates and be humane with them. Do not punish them harshly, which is a very unpopular piece of advice. But Pompey, in respect for Pisidonius, and one who, because he wanted to understand the humanity of those pirates, and he wanted to really act in a way that was in accordance with divine reason, he actually agreed that Pisidonius's approach was better and spared their lives. In the book, we go from Pasadena's to a modern application. I actually really like this application uh, because it involves a community. So a lot of the times in, in self-help books, um, you might get a very famous individual who does something uh, extraordinary. And yes, we do have some examples of people who do things extraordinarily. And uh, rightly, the example is, is given in the book to encourage us to move forward, to push our own boundaries. But I also, with Leo, wanted to make sure that we gave some sort of community sense. So one of the examples we gave was Cambridge Central Mosque, which is Europe's first eco-mosque. So this community, if you're a Muslim, you may already know, uh, it's called to pray five times a day. The men are obliged if they're, if they're close enough to the mosque to go, and women are actively encouraged. And these prayers are in line with what is going on with the sun during the day. So you can see that the prayer, the most, most sacred moment of a Muslim's life, is intricately connected to the position of the sun in the sky. It's a, it's a building that's used on a daily basis, and it really is... They said rooted in even seasons. So winter times will be prayer times will be different to summer times, and that's why Ramadan as well get shorter and longer. So the Cambridge uh, community felt that if they built a, built a mosque that was both pleasant to the eye and pleasant to be in, whilst also being ecologically considerate, would be the way forward to revere God and appreciate His creation. They saw it as their role as Muslims to build the most sacred building in their lives in a way that was, I would say, living according to nature. And that was a decisive action that makes sense according to who they are. So this outside is a picture of outside the mosque. And you can see, again, the sense of the garden, the sense of being outside and being at one with God, the building itself you just saw, the prayer room. It's about the breath of the divine. There's natural light and ventilation. There's heat pumps. There's efficient energy uh, light bulbs. Heating and cooling is as needed and is completely natural, works with nature rather than against it. You have rainwater collection, green roofs and bird boxes. And importantly, from a cosmopolitan point of view, so the idea of the universal humanity, it actually has features that wouldn't be out of place in a rural churchyard in England because they wanted to integrate and incorporate values to demonstrate that they saw their identity as Muslims, but equally acknowledged their identity as part of the English community, which doesn't always happen in, uh, in mosque building exercises because it can have quite an oriental look. The result was that people felt more comfortable in visiting the mosque, even non-Muslims like to visit. They have uh, various tours, which is why I recommend thoroughly going, just so that you can see for yourself the beauty of this building. And they were upset that there was a bus stop in, 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 front, of, in front of the um, building because it, it really disrupted their views. So that was like a different way of looking at it. Like we as Muslims, we are called to do something that's unusual in the traditional English context, but how can we do it in a way that brings in and invites rather than creates a sense of otherness? Um, returning back to you now. So you've just been told, or I've just told you there's no one size fits all. The living according to nature will always depend on who you are, your preferences and your circumstances. And there will be, it will be a factor of those, uh, those various variables. However, there are a few pointers in the sense that Stoics are expected to be knowledgeable about the world. We are expected to know something or know someone who knows something. We're not called to know everything. The sage, uh, the, the most uh, the wisest human that could ever live and face a human existence um, is as rare as a phoenix 
and yet they are not all knowing. But they would, and when they don't know though, they know who it would be appropriate to ask. We, also, we must not just take um, a political parties or a certain newspapers or a certain friends' opinion unless we weigh that up and say, is it likely that they really do know about this? That would be a wise thing to do. And to give you a slightly easy example, like, okay, I, I do know something, but what does that mean I, I should do? Well, if you're an architect, you know how to build, you know how to design a building. So I would argue if you're a sage architect, you would design it in a way that works in accordance with nature, that doesn't go against natural cycles, it doesn't demand extra energy. If you just live there, you're not an architect, then I would say the way you live uh, reflects your desire to live according to nature. Um, the way you arrange things, the way the, the way you buy things and where you buy things and the energy you use and how you use it and why you use it that way, that would be living according to nature. Not, it's not about calling you to be the architect and the builder and building this beautifully ecologically friendly, or environmentally friendly house. It's about doing what you must do in your role to consider it properly and to do it well. So I hope that this presentation has given you some, some indications as to how you might, how you might well um, consider live in accordance with nature, according to your role, how you might think about coming to your role. Um, again, um, I'm very approachable. You can email me um, via strikekai.com. You can ask me for um, the papers. You can tweet me. I'm very open on the Facebook um, groups, various of them. So if, if you have further questions about living according to nature or even about the book, being better. Um, I'm happy to answer it. Um, thank you very much for joining me. And I hope that um, you find it interesting and you feel encouraged in being able to think carefully about your role and to live in accordance with the beautiful world that we have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for that video. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It was a privilege. It is always a privilege to be able to share ideas. Um, well, I guess, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your book and when it's expected to come out? Yeah, so it's coming out in April, and everyone's like, I want to buy it now. And I was like, yeah, I'd like it to be out now. We're all practicing temperance, right? So it, it's, it's good to practice that. And there is actually a bonus of not being out right now in the sense that I think it's good to reflect on something like, okay, what does stories mean to me? And not just go out and buy something just because you, you like, like to talk. I mean, and obviously that's like an ideal situation in a, in a capitalistic or neoliberalism kind of setting. But I think if an idea is strong enough, people will remember it. So when it's out, it's out. So I'm, try, I'm trying to practice patience too. So the book is actually written. I can't say much, but, um, too much, but the book is actually written. So it's literally the copy editing stage. Like the ideas are there. The idea is not going to change. I guess they're trying to delete some of my British, uh, British English because it was really strange to write it for a predominantly American audience. So that was like, what do you mean you don't want me to put a U in color? That was really painful. Mm. Uh, but uh, so that's, I think they're trying to do that because um, basically British people don't understand American expressions, but not the other way around. So I think that they're trying to make it a little bit um, more um, general mm. in terms of language. That's where we're at. And also from a copy editor's point of view, some of the strike terms are quite complicated. So they have to make sure like this is clearly explained. Somebody can go to the bookstore, to use an American phrase or bookshop to use a British one and get and understand what indifferent means. So, you know, it, it is there, it is written, but we're just ironing out like differences in cult cultural differences that I didn't know existed, <laughs> to put it like that. Watch your mic there. Um, so we've yeah. got a question here from Steve. Um, uh, as we wait with patience for your upcoming book, where can we learn more about Zephyrus? Zephyrus is actually, Steve, it's, I mean, it's really hard to get. The Life of Plutarch is, uh, sorry, yeah, Plutarch's work, Life of Argus the Fourth, sorry. Plutarch's a really good uh, reference for that, but you really have to dig. So most, uh, in modern strike movement, we tend to co concentrate on the pomegranate, but, and I also had to go through like Machiavelli as well. So you have to kind of like put the jigsaw pieces together. So like 
I mean, somebody asked me recently, what would be the difference between like your book and the one that just came out with Ryan Holiday? And I would say, well, different audience, different kind of style. Uh, he probably didn't dig as deep as an academic might. That doesn't mean he didn't, but I, I think like 12 years training to be an academic <laughs> gives you like the ability to go, right, I need this piece and, and cross-reference in a way that maybe others who haven't been trained to do that. So Spirits was quite tough to get. Panitius, he's like, he's really important in the, in the period that he's in. But again, you have to go through the pieces. So there was a lot of work in cross-referencing with uh, colleagues. So for example, out of Nucci and go, okay, the Greek word is these, <laughs> things like that. So it was really an in-depth thing. Uh, I think the easiest, easiest way is unfortunately to wait for the book and then we can talk about more because I wasn't going to just send you loads of fragments. So I try to put it together then. Oh yeah, certainly Plutarch's Life of Arches the Fourth, if you're really into it, which I know you are, Steve. Uh, so uh, Greg Seiler has, what mistaken interpretations of classical Stoic ideas would you say most get in the way of a productive modern Stoic approach in the present? I think the biggest misunderstanding, and you and I have spoken about this on video, is that people have a very sort of, it's about um, me, myself, and I. Like this most superficial, so I'm not talking just to clarify everybody else, I'm not talking about academics necessarily or people being in stoicism quite a while the first thing is always about often always about what weight stoicism does for me and as i said in the speech like that's a really silly question it, it, i feel like jfk right but it is a little bit about what can you do for your cosmopolitan community right rather than what can you do for your country but i think jfk although it's a very american kind of speech is actually very in a sense he can apply if you apply it wider it would actually be a very stoic sentiment so I think, unfortunately, there is a sort of selfish element that gets in the way that people say, okay, I, I can't, why would I care about the environment? I don't control it. Well, you know, I, I'm not responsible for all the plastic in the sea. And I always say to them, well, what happens if that one turtle that is going in the sea, swimming around, snorts the straw that you drank, that drank from? You don't know if that's your straw. And if you hadn't done that, maybe that tail wouldn't have died. So it's like, okay, you've got this massive problem. But if you said, okay, everybody's going to die one day, let's get rid of all the doctors. People would say that was silly. People would say I was criminal if I did that. Yeah, when I talk about environmental issues, people are like, no, it's just, it's just too much. But if I talk about like medical issues, like, okay, so your mom's going to die one day. Why don't we just leave her to die? Like everyone was like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> it's kind of like this, 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 this disconnect with, if it's a medical issue, we understand that we really care about our, you know, our parents or our kids, if it's an environmental issue, there's not this real understanding or literacy or eco-literacy about we should really care about the planet too. Thanks, Greg, for that question. Um, uh, Mark asks us, uh, was the slide about Posidonius going to see the Druids himself a recommendation to experience things or ideas firsthand and not rely on others' interpretations or writings thereof? I mean, absolutely. He could have just like, for whatever, you know, because Julius Caesar wrote a lot of propaganda, people say. I mean, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to say it. But there is this sort of notion that it was a very Roman take. I mean, the same as Panitius is very, he, we speak about Panitius specifically, he's a uh, Pasadonius, his mentor, about how he takes certain ideas. He's not a Kim Kardashian of the day, but there is a similarity to being having a very powerful family and obviously the kind of stoicism that he wanted he changed the flavor. So this is really important though, when you, when, you, when you go to anything. So yes, at the moment, probably not traveling is the best idea. So it doesn't mean you have to physically travel. It's more like being willing to go to the primary sources now, or go to someone that knows. A lot of time we spend on social media and I include myself and I've had to learn to withdraw like, do I know about this subject? Do I actually know something about it? The answer is no. Am I willing to find out? The answer may, may be yes. And for example, um, Mark, I've asked Greg Sadler a lot of times for something I don't know. I mean, he he gets phone. He probably has a lot of missed calls from me. But like, it's just like I don't know the answer. I'm not I'm not trained in philosophy in the extent that he is. I have you know training in stoicism that I sort of put myself through. But I might have a question like, and how does that work with like Plato's Republic? And I wouldn't know that. Right, it's only because I go to the people that I consider to be in authority. Uh, for example, Steve. For example, I ask him about biology. So it's about going to people. It's not like you have to go and get every single answer, but I would say surround yourself with people that do know things. So in my case, you might say, well, I know a lot about environmental issues, but I wouldn't be very comfortable, for example, to answer about um, more psychological uh, practices that you could use in stories. So people ask, what would you do to, you know, 
feel less, say, less uh, down or depressed? And I say, I don't really know because I don't have the answer. That's not my subject. I'm giving you a piece of advice, which is one, I'm not a doctor. Two, I'm not a trained, trained psychologist in any way. And three, you could probably ask your neighbor and get just as good answer. So I think also it's about being careful about what you know and what you don't know, especially if you're in, you know, you're an academic or you have a public, some public authority in the field. I think it can be very dangerous uh, to overstep the mark and say, yes, I know something about CBT, when in my case, I know less than most people sitting here. It's just not my subject. I think that's what we're going to be careful about, knowing and knowing when we should ask, which is why I said the sage doesn't know, has to know everything, doesn't know everything, but knows who to ask. So a question for myself, I was watching your video and thinking about um, the, the Cenos Republic. And do you feel that um, that at least the traditional stoicism as put forward is at all compatible with capitalism? I think, I think it's, I do think it is. It's a very good question, a very loaded question. <laughs> I do, we did talk about this in, um, in the chapter about Panitius because he's so wealthy, right? He's in like this like, special circle or special friends almost i would say capitalism yes i would say neoliberalism no and there is a difference i don't mind who's responsible for the way goods are distributed i'm i get upset when neoliberalism masquerades a free trade right masquerades as capitalism so that's where like adam smith says like the invisible hand but if you read his work properly it's very clear that he says there are checks and balances right so yes the market looks after itself in theory, right? but there are always checks and balances, and that you should, he actually talks about like the wealth of a nation, which is talking about within the boundaries of a nation, so this cold, cold concept of uh, free trade across borders, when you have very unbalanced, let's put it this way, Mexico, you give, Mexico gives all the avocados to the US, the US gives them, US gives them corn syrup, that's not the imagination that Adam Smith's had when he talks about the importance of capitalism, so I don't have an issue with capitalism per se, I think it worked, I also think if socialism has checks and balances, it can work. The problem is we don't do well with checks, <laughs> checks and balances. And that's what stories I think is about. So if you said to me, would Stoics just trade? I think globally that wouldn't make sense anymore. It doesn't make sense to do that. I mean, he's talking in an, I, so you know, talking in an idle city state, but if you're talking about a global world, I mean, you have to be realistic and go, but I just can't grow quinoa <laughs> in London. And if I want quinoa, I'm going to have to get from Bolivia or at least from Portugal because the weather's just not going to give it, give it to me. So we've got to be realistic. I don't think it'd be, I don't think that we would be anti-capitalism, but I don't think we'd be absolutely not neoliberalistic at all. We'd say, hang on a minute, what does free trade mean? And is the agreement fair? So I, I know it's a bit of a nuanced question, but yes, we do actually address that a little bit more in the book because of this, because not only because of Silicon Valley, but this kind of thing that, Therefore, if you agree with Zeno, you must be, I don't know, communist. Well, no, because it depends what you mean by communist, right? And Greg is a better person to ask than, than I am about this. So uh, again, from Greg Sadler, uh, you mentioned the article that you brought uh, your co-writer, Leo, about Chris Gill and myself, Greg, on, I think it's excellent to do co-writing. Why do you think there's so little of that in the humanities? Should there be more? Uh, uh, that's an excellent question. I, in humanities, you don't get credit. If you co-author, there's no credit for you. There's no benefit. Your your pay packet is not. You know your your whole privilege as a as an academic is just really not recognised. Uh, because I my pay is actually linked to engineering, and my main job is environmental sciences and engineering sustainability. I do the stoic stuff in my quote unquote spare time. So I don't feel shackled to the need to be, oh, I'm the one who did it myself. I also think like it's anti-stoic and quite foolish actually to say, well, I know everything. I remember um, Chris Gill and you, for, and Leo, all of you contributing in philosophical things as I was really stuck, as I was able to understand the scientific nature of what is the DNA saying? So I think the problem is that hum the way that the iron, uh, sorry, the ivory tower is built, it, it's just not, it's not conducive to actually intelligent discussion and debate. I also find in philosophy papers nobody reference each other because they can't say that somebody else had a good idea. Whereas in engineering, you have a much more collaborative uh, field simply because you couldn't do a paper 
it's not just about writing. One's got to do the calculations. One's got to do the diagrams. One's got to do the the translation of the of the the numbers into the into English or whatever language you're writing. And you just can't really do it all yourself in philosophy because it's one skill set. It doesn't mean that because philosophers are more intelligent. It's like because it, the one skill set is the thinking and writing. One person can, in theory, do that because it's much narrower. When you have applied engineering, you really have to come in together in, in a group. I just don't think you would be able to write a paper by yourself. I mean, some people do, but it's incredibly rare. And you get credit for that. It's, it, the incentive, there's a great incentive to contribute and collaborate together. You get actually, for example, I got praised for writing an engineering paper with a with an institute in Austria. Oh my gosh, they're amazing. You've got them on your side. When I do a philosophy paper, it's like, what do you mean you didn't write it by yourself? It, it's, a, it's a strange culture going on. Thanks for your question again. Oh. Uh like to expand upon this this process of like especially when you, the book that you're writing now requires as greg puts it philosophical detective work where you have to be pouring through potentially thousands of sources to find your information you find that that is actually a uh, much more beneficial to have that uh, collaborator well with that layer the book wouldn't have happened i mean i remember uh they said to me i mean my agent said you want to co-author? <laughs> it was like, it was like, he's like, I love it, but it's so unusual. I co-author as well. But I mean, he, unfortunately he died during the COVID. I've got a new agent, but that's what he he just said. Like, I, I, I can't believe you want to do that. I'm like, if I don't do this, it's not going to happen. It's going to be poorer for it. I am not trained in the way that Leo is trained. I don't have the patience to go for the amount of primaries that he did. So the, even like when I'm discussing about you did most of the writing, right? I'm like, it's not about who did most of the writing, okay? It's about what, it doesn't matter about in terms of percentage, it's about what, how much you can say it's a Kai book. It's not a Kai book. It is, the idea was to, to bring forth a storyism that I felt women would identify with because it was based on what Zeno said, Chrysippus said, Cato actually did, that people who don't want to use stoicism for their business opportunities would understand it. I, I, wonder, I wrote it for people like you, Greg, who like, had this immense knowledge. I wanted to surprise you, like, maybe you don't know this, though. Because I wanted it to be coming across in a, in a few levels. I wanted people who were immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself, living in Portugal right now, instead of an expat. So we, we criticize the idea of like a British person gets called an expat, which I hate. So we talk about the fact that I'm an immigrant and that Leo's an immigrant too. In the US and how all the you know early stakes more or less were immigrants theorists came from Ukraine which is not so far from Greece if you cross you know the lake in the middle so we wanted to show like this this whole lie about the dead white men it really irritated me because it's not true like it it's just not true so they were saying like one of the marketing was asking us so you mean that you're you're developing a new stoicism that so it's open to everyone I'm like no like I'm not doing anything. I'm taking the ideas that are already there, which took some time because it took a lot. I mean, going through Machiavelli wasn't really my strong point. <laughs> it's not something I really, really liked. But we got it there. Like it's in plain, it's in plain sight, but no one, no one looks at it because it's hard to do that development. And then they say, how are you going to make a self-help book out of really going to the life of Plutarch? It's like Plutarch, the life of Argus the Fourth. And we're like, because you need to do it. We need to show that this is not a white male thing it really is a cosmopolitan call but people are lazy sometimes and they don't want to do that so I wanted to say look I've done it for you not for every story but I've done quite a lot and we on purpose we didn't include Seneca for example we did it on purpose because we thought that would piss him off before if we because we knew that Seneca would be like I should definitely be in that kind of book before what happens <laughs> if we don't include you just just out of principle just just for fun like to prove that it's not all about Seneca, it's not all, all about Marcus Aurelius. Mm -hmm. It's about this whole sort of um, story. And we, I know we break it down to early, middle and late Stoic, but actually we don't tend to look at the links between them. They kind of get lost in the translation. And I wanted to show people there's not an early, if you think about it, early, middle and late, because there are links between all of them. So we spend a lot of time talking about the links and how Stoicism changes and sort of, sort of fluctuates, but it's not like there's a, about it. I know we do that academically because it's easier, but it's not true. So you're just like, okay, there's, there is this split, but why did this split come about? What was it about? Canitis and Rose, that, why did that happen? Who was he? Who was his grandparent? Like, <laughs> I was trying to tell their story in a way that it could, you could approach it as a woman and say, 
wait a minute, there's a Spartan queen and she's stoic, that's amazing. And then somebody said, wait, there's an immigrant? They're like they're all immigrants, that's brilliant. And a wealthy person said, there's an emperor, that's excellent. So it was trying to show that there was something for everybody if you just looked a bit harder. So a lot of, a lot, there, was a lot of there was a lot of study, but I'm hoping that even if the most academic, I'm hoping, for example, that Tony Long says to me, well, I didn't even know that. That was the kind of goal, like, could someone like my mum pick it up and go, didn't know that. And someone like Tony Longer, I didn't know that. So that's what we tried to do. We didn't want to tell the same stories that had always been told. We didn't want to tell the spirits on the pomegranate story because it had already been said. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Kai. Uh, we got. Yeah.